So <coughs> theology matters in the public square. That's the, that's the matter for discussion this evening. Today's message is about the importance of theology in the public square. We make no secret here that we believe theology does matter in the public square. Why does it matter that we take our theology out in public? Shouldn't we, as someone has once said, just live and let live? More importantly, by what authority can we do this? Do we have a right to do this? Aren't we just to keep it a private matter? Aren't we just to mind our own business? Didn't Paul urge Timothy to teach believers to lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity? It would seem, and it is manifestly evident today in most churches, that anyone who would think that he has a right to engage in the culture, and especially the government, would be doing a strange thing, would be going against the authority of the Scriptures. In fact, far too many people today, and especially Christians, believe that this is some novel idea to take theology into the public square. I would be the first to tell you that this is no novel idea. It wasn't always the case that believers thought that religion should be kept private, as they do today, and to be kept isolated from the public. Far from it. Any, any student of church history knows that this is not true. More importantly, any student of the Bible knows that this is not true. Neither history nor the scriptures teach that Christians always believed in privatizing their faith. Sure, you can find periods in church history. You can find periods in uh, the scriptures where the church isolated themselves from culture. But this was never painted in a positive light. The results were devastating to the church and to the culture. The results for the church was that they, were, instead of influencing the world for Christ, they were influenced by the world, conformed to the world. And the results for the culture was rot and decay. But if you're not inclined to take my word for it, then do your homework. Do some research. And you will find that this was customary, that is, for Christians to be salt and light. To be the light of the world and to take a stand, I'm sorry, to be the salt of the earth, to be the light of the world, and take a stand against evil. Why? This is the question that we need to get down to the bottom. As always, I'd like to find out, is there a scriptural basis for what we're doing? And there is. And I'll provide a number of reasons. But first, because Jesus is Lord. And that means that he is Lord of heaven and earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He has exclusive rights to everything. There isn't one square inch on this planet where Christ does not say, where Christ says, not mine. It's all his. So the public square is God's square. It belongs to him. The public square is not Satan's square. The public square is not man's square. The public square is not the government's square. It's Christ's square. Okay? Christ has all authority, all power, both in heaven and in earth, and commands us that as we go out, as we interact with people in the public square, we unashamedly speak, teach, and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that we follow that up with those whom the Lord adds to his church, baptism, and teaching men the commands of Christ, all that Christ commands. Does Christ command us to go into all the church and preach the gospel? No. He commands us to go into all the world. We get that, right? Do we, do we get that? I mean, this, is, this isn't that hard. He, he, he commands us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, this is a tall order, but we're under orders as his people. We are under orders. We are under the lordship of Christ. He commands us to go because he is Lord and King, and his law is not just the law of heaven, it's also the law of earth. And we also find in the teaching of the apostles 
which is consistent with the rest of the scriptures, that as believers, we are to resist evil, to take a stand against it. Not just personally and privately, but publicly. Even as Paul says in Ephesians, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead, even expose them. Wow. What does that mean? What is Paul saying there? Is Paul saying that we should speak out about the unfruitful deeds of darkness in the public square? No, Paul, Paul, Paul couldn't possibly be saying that. Isn't sin only something that Christians deal with privately in the church? This is, this, this is a church matter, isn't it, right? Why would Paul say something like that? Doesn't Paul know that religion and politics shouldn't be discussed in mixed company? How could he say such a thing? Well, he did say such a thing, and what he said was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So unless we're going to say that Paul's writing was not inspired scripture, then we had better pay careful attention to what he says as being the written word of God, the very words of God. We must pay careful attention and search the scriptures, just as the Bereans did, to find out if what is being said is true or false. So, you should ask yourself, and I should ask, is this idea of going out into the public square, is it 16 ounces to the pound, or is it more like 10? We're going to look at that. Let's go back to the beginning for a minute. Let's examine the statement, theology matters in the public square. Those of you who have been regularly coming to the Bible Institute, you understand that theology is the study of God, the study of things related to God and the scriptures. But what's the public square? Well, according to Webster's uh, dictionary, it has a twofold meaning. It is both an open public place in a town or city where people gather together, and it is also a place of public opinion. So let's put those two ideas together. It's an open public place where people come together, and it's a place of public opinion. So that's that's the idea of the public square. It's the marketplace of opinions. So we're coming into the public square not with another opinion, are we? We're coming with the truth of God. We're coming with objective truth into the public square, and there's going to be friction because we will just be viewed as bringing, what, another opinion, right? Who are you? Um, Just like Paul to the men of Athens. Um, They didn't like his opinion. They thought it was an opinion. So we understand that uh, the idea of the public square has somewhat changed today, right? Do people gather in, the public, squ- in public squares and in towns and villages today and talk and stuff like that? Well, maybe some places, but for the most part, where's, where does this happen? It, it happens from the comforts of your home. It happens through the internet. It happens through your smartphones. It happens through Facebook, Twitter, Gab, Signal, or other social media platforms. And there are many today. And it has somewhat changed the idea of the public square. But the basic concept is still the same. The location has changed, but the idea remains the same. Interaction in the public square today can happen anywhere where there is a computer. Now, I'm going to digress for a minute. Because I am thankful for modern technology. I really am. I listen to podcasts all the time. Like, at work, I'm always listening to sermons and stuff. And um, I can never get enough of it. So I'm grateful for it, and I think probably most of us are. The volume of information that is available to us is simply remarkable. And not only this, but the speed at which we are able to communicate with each other is a modern wonder. Now, having said that, the downside to social media and to modern communication is little to no face-to-face interaction. Talking on the phone and texting is one thing, but face-to-face interaction with another person is irreplaceable and invaluable. In fact, the world needs, and this is why I say that, because the world needs to see, especially in the public square, they need to see that you're the real McCoy. You can call someone and tell them something. You can text them, but when they see you face-to-face, they see all of you. They see how you react. 
They see how you react to conflict. And if you're a Christian, they'll see Christ in you, won't they? Okay? A little bit more difficult to see through a text message or through a phone conversation. People need to see your good works so that they will be able to glorify God. Then they will be convinced that you not only talk the talk, but that you walk the walk. We need to practice what we preach. But whatever we do, let us not forget the importance of face-to-face interaction, especially in regards to the public square. And I'm thankful that we've been able to start practicing that here with evangelism and um, other such things. It's been a, an incredible and helpful experience um, the past year or so. And I would even argue that you really can't get to know someone unless you meet them in person. Okay? I think you would agree. I, th- I think you would agree with this really quickly. Okay? Think about this. If you had a choice, would you pick a spouse over the internet without meeting them in person? <laughs> think about it. Would you set aside personal interaction and merely settle for, the, for an internet bio? I don't think so. Would you choose a pastor without ever meeting him in person? I would hope not. Certainly, there, there may be exceptions to this, okay? But for the most part, and I believe the best and most profitable interactions with others, especially in public, happen face to face. So here's my proposition. I am going to argue that theology not only matters in the public square, but it is our Christian duty. It is our Christian duty. That's right. Conversely, not to do theology in the public square is disobedience to Christ. How can I say that? We will get to that shortly. But before I build the case, we need to do a little bit of house cleaning because there's a number of obstacles in the way, false ideas, bad theology, that has hindered believers from this duty. What are they? A false view of the kingdom of God, a false view of the world, and a false view of the gospel. These are not the only three things that are hindering the church, but I'm limiting my discussion to these matters because they are so prevalent today and because of time. First, a false view of the kingdom of God. There are many today who don't believe the kingdom of God is now. They hold that it is all in the future. There has been a postponement, they say, to the kingdom of God until Christ returns. Not only this, but they also assert that there are actually two kingdoms, the kingdom of God, not presently here, on earth, and the kingdom of man, which is alive and active today in the world, as we all know. Is this what the Bible teaches? I do not believe that is what the Bible teaches. First, there is not a single verse in the Bible that says that the kingdom of God has been postponed. Christ said to the religious leaders in Matthew 21, 43, The kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing the fruit of it. There was certainly a transition in the kingdom. It went from one nation, the Jewish nation, to another nation. And that's singular, nation. But that nation is what Peter describes in his letter. You are a holy nation. That's the church, the ecclesia, more accurately. So we see a transition, but we don't see a postponement. And how did Jesus teach his disciples to pray? Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Apparently Jesus thought the kingdom of God was a present reality. And... um, Why would Jesus teach his disciples to pray for God's kingdom to come to earth if it was all going to be a future event? Think about that. Glorification is a future event. We know that. No one disputes that. We aren't told to um, pray for that. Why? 
because we know that it won't happen until we die, until we leave this mortal body behind. But probably the most famous text used by believers to prove that God's kingdom is all in the future is John 18, 36, when Jesus said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. And wouldn't it seem that, and uh, you know, it, it seems like this, this text would just end the whole discussion on the matter, and it does for some people. The problem is not what Jesus said. He really did say that. The problem is how many men misinterpret what Jesus said. So what did Christ mean when he said, my kingdom is not of this world? If you go back to John 17, go back one chapter from when Jesus said that, you will see clearly what Jesus meant. He uses the same phrase in, in verse 16. So John 17, 16, Christ says, about his disciples in the high priestly prayer. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Okay? It's the same language. So, if being not of the world means not present in the world, then Jesus was delusional. <laughs> Jesus was not delusional. Obviously, what he said what he meant was that he and his disciples were not following the worldly evil system. That is how they were not of the world. It could not mean that he wasn't present in the world. It couldn't mean that. Because he was there and his disciples were there, but he said that they were not of the world. And he said the same thing when he referred to the kingdom of God. It's not of this world, but it was in the world. And it was in the world at that time, for the Jews. And Jesus said, I'm going to take it away from you and give it to another nation. So he's talking about the, the way that the kingdom of God operates is not the way that it operates down here. But lastly, Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now we got a big problem here if we believe. If we believe that the kingdom of God is all future, okay? Because the new birth is the entryway into the kingdom of God. Okay? But, if the, but if, if the kingdom of God is a future event, as some men assert, then how can anyone be born again today? I, I, I don't understand that. But obviously, I think that people that hold that are just inconsistent with their view. Lastly, Paul says in Colossians 1.13, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. So at conversion, God transfers the child of God into his kingdom. This isn't a future event only, but it's a present reality. It's pretty clear that the scriptures teach that the kingdom of God is a present reality. Not fully realized, not saying that, but nonetheless present, active, and growing like a mustard seed. And what about the idea that there are two kingdoms? What about this idea? Does the Bible teach this? Well, let's listen to the words of Joel McDermott in his book, which I picked up. It's really, really helpful. It's called Inglorious Kingdoms. Quote, the church is the heavenly kingdom, we are told. Everything, everything else, all those worldly matters, pertains to the earthly kingdom. Thus, we have two kingdoms, and never the two shall meet until Christ returns. The two kingdoms mentality tells us, one, that the Old Testament law no longer applies, except maybe the Ten Commandments in a vague moral sense, what you do in your private life. And two, all social and civil matters will fall out according to God's will in the realm of nature and under the rule of earthly governments. Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. So they ignore the vast majority, if not all the Bible's social teaching. And then they direct their people to the pagan welfare state for social needs. End quote. Well, pious as this may seem, 
It's not what the scriptures teach, this idea of two kingdom theology. And the fruit of this is bad, and the fruit of this bad theology, it can be seen when we look at what happened to the church in Germany. The German church, for the most part, embraced two kingdom theology. And Hitler strongly enforced it among the German churches. Yep. He took advantage of them. Hitler was successful in this. Not so much the German church. We need to learn from this. We need, we, <laughs> you know, get, the German church lost miserably. They completely bought into the two kingdom theology. And Hitler fought tooth and nail against them. There was some resistance with Bonhoeffer and, and, and some other churches, and even the Catholic Church resisted Hitler. They, there was an encyclical that was released, and it was better than anything I've seen written today, you know, from most, most churches, from a Catholic perspective, um, dividing, uh, distinguishing the difference between church and state. We are going through this same thing right now with our government. And a a, a tyrannical state will not be content to let the church be the church. Their (coughs) Their evil design is either to enslave their subjects or to eliminate them. Next, a false view of the world. A false view of the world. What false view of the world is prevalent today that keeps the church from engaging in the public square? It is the idea that the world is evil and Christians should separate from it altogether. If we interact with the world, we might get um, contaminated. So we should isolate ourselves, withdraw, and practice our faith in private. Just leave us alone. Gary DeMar, in his book, Miss Lies and Half-Truths, says, quote, Historically, the church did not divide the world into two opposing realms, consisting of the, the good and the sacred spiritual realm, and then the, the bad secular material realm. No, no. More importantly, the Bible does not divide the world that way. The Bible is concerned about the distinction between good and evil, right and wrong, moral and immoral, whether it's in the church or in the world, whether material or spiritual, end quote. So the truth of the matter is, all things created by God are good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. The world, the created material order, is an evil but good, because God made it and said, it is good. I'm not talking about the evil world system that's under the power and influence of Satan. I'm talking about the created order. Can I ask you something? Does the Bible talk about the redemption of creation? Not just the redemption of man. Does the Bible talk about the redemption of creation? Because that's something that isn't discussed often in evangelical churches and even in Reformed. Well, I don't have time to really go there, but if you read Romans 8, 19 through 22, you will see that God's plan in Christ isn't just to redeem men, but it's to redeem all things in creation. Okay? We can't get around that. We may not understand it. We may not agree like it, but it's in the Scriptures. And we, we, need to, we need to understand why it's there. What does it mean? Part of God's creation was family, church, and government. All these things are good, believe it or not. Now, there's bad families, bad churches, bad governments. But that's a different matter. Just because something goes bad is no reason to reject it. It's no reason to ignore it. Should we reject marriage because we have a high divorce rate in this country? 
No. Should we give up on the church because there have been bad church people? No. You get the idea. God has called us to be salt and light. We are to be God's representatives to preserve both men and creation through the gospel and teaching men to obey the commands of Christ. That will lead to a better society, a better world. And this was always part of God's purpose and plan in Christ. God's plan is to reconcile all things in Christ, things in heaven and on earth. The church should be in the business of seeing the fallen world that we live in as needing redemption, needing revival, reformation, but not rejection. We are to transform the world for Christ, not reject it. If we deny this calling, evil will rise up and fill the vacuum, as it's doing right now. But the Great Commission implies social transformation, and we'll get to that. A false view of the gospel. A false view of the gospel. This definitely uh, has hindered uh, theology making a difference in the public square. So the idea here is, well, it's one that we've heard quite a bit these last few years, namely, just preach the gospel. That's all the church should be doing, according to some brothers. The idea here is that Christians should devote their time exclusively to bringing men to Christ, nothing else. It's misguided. They, they say it's misguided and even a waste of time to be distracted by things like education, economics, art, music, and politics, of course. Now, we would be right to agree with them that it's a priority to preach the gospel, a top priority. But it is not the only priority, the only duty that we are given as followers of Christ. Okay? And I actually don't think this is a very difficult knot to untie. Let me explain it this way. There is a man who needs Christ. He's lost in his sin. A believer comes by and witnesses to him, shares the gospel. The man accepts Christ. He believes in him, and he's saved. That's all that matters, right? Just preach the gospel. That's all that matters. We're good to go. Next, next person. That, that's, that's the idea. Let's flush it out. Let's flush it out. That's the idea. I, I, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe I've misunderstood this, this thought, but I think, that that's, I think that that's pretty much the idea. Just preach the gospel. Don't do anything else. If we believe that our only engagement with the culture is just preach the gospel and nothing else, then we are, ignore, we are ignoring a whole host of scripture that teaches otherwise. I'm in no way promoting a social gospel. Far from it. I know what the social gospel is. The social gospel has nothing to do with the message of Christ and him crucified whatsoever. Okay? That's not what I'm talking about. Christ is the gospel. And when men believe the gospel, guess what? It changes them. Now God's law is written on their hearts. Now they have new desires, new values, and a new lifestyle. The thief no longer steals, but works and gives according to what the scriptures teach, right? The shopkeeper is no longer dishonest, but becomes fair and just in his economics and uses just weights and measures according to the scriptures. You get the idea. Social transformation does happen by men and women whose hearts are converted and transformed by the gospel into the image of Christ. Okay? This is inevitable. The dynamic of, of the new birth in the life of a person who's born again will lead to social transformation because everything about them changes. They are a new creature in Christ. Old things have gone. Behold, all things have become new. 
So what does the Bible say about this? Well, I will just show you a couple passages. First, Romans 1. When Paul opens up his letter, he explains to them that his apostleship from God was to preach the gospel and bring about the obedience of faith among the Gentiles for his namesake. The obedience of faith. You see, there are necessary implications of the gospel. It isn't good enough that men believe it and then are left alone. Paul did not leave men as babes. He nursed them on to maturity in Christ. He wouldn't settle for anything less than obedient, an obedient faith in Christ. It's a serious error to miss this. And again, in Colossians 1.28, Paul says, We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. It's the same idea. <clears throat> Paul did not just preach the gospel. He discipled men. He taught men to follow Christ's commands. Like when he says, what is it, in Colossians, we, we weren't busybodies. We, we worked with our own hands. He made tents. He showed them how to work, how to be a good steward of his time and resources. Um, I, I think that's good for culture when we have people that are honest with um, change, with, honest with the dollar. Is, is that a, do you think that's going to benefit society or be a bad thing? Um, I think you know the answer to that. The gospel is just the beginning. Discipleship is just as much a duty of believers as is evangelism. Listen to R.J. R. Rushduni on this matter. The key to rem remedying the modern situation is not revolution nor any kind of resistance that works to subvert law and order. The New Testament abounds in warnings against disobedience and in summons to peace. The key is regeneration, propagation of the gospel, and the conversion of men and nations to God's law word. End quote. Yes, we must preach the gospel, and would that those who make this exclusive claim do such that we wouldn't be in half the mess that we are in, I think, if they actually did what they tell us that we should be doing. But as we saw from Paul, evangelism isn't our only duty in the public square. It is also discipleship. And when men are, in fact, discipled, when they are taught how to obey all of Christ's commands, they will be transformed into the image of Christ. They will have new values. They will have new desires. They will have a new lifestyle, which inevitably will lead to a transformation of culture and society. In the words of Joel McDermott, people, quote, people change their values, behaviors, businesses, parenting, education, personal finance, etc. When they become servants of Christ and begin to learn and observe all things that he commanded. They also usually vote differently and view law and social issues differently. These changes will, by definition, have an impact on culture. And as more people are brought under the lordship of Christ, in this way, the more, culture, the, more the culture itself will reflect Christ's teaching as a corporate whole. End quote. <clears throat> now, I'd like to finish up this, um, this message on... Um, Matthew chapter 5, we're going to just work through the text a little bit. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. So if you would turn there with me, Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. It's uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew five thirteen to 16, <clears throat> verse thir 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father 
who is in heaven. First notice that when Christ speaks of salt and light, he says to his listeners, you are the salt. You are the light. It is not the world that is salt and light. They are the bitters of the earth, not the salt of the earth. They are the darkness in this world, not the light of the world. Do you see what Christ is saying here? The world needs us. The world needs us. They need our savor. They need our light. Or else they will become, what, decadent and blind. We are the essential ingredient to preserve the world from rot and decay. We are the essential tool to help the world see. And what will they see? Paul says that the fruit of the light is goodness and righteousness and truth. The fruit of the light is goodness and righteousness and truth. The world is not sustained by itself and preserved by itself. It is sustained and it is preserved through the church, which is the pillar and support of the truth. Where the church is salt and light, societies will be preserved. That's a fact. And just think of the position that the Lord elevates his disciples to, salt and light. It might seem insignificant, but I can assure you it's not. He doesn't say, you are a light, but the light. Paul says the same thing in Ephesians. You who were formerly darkness are now light in the Lord. He doesn't even say a light. He says light. To be certain, we are not the source of light. Only God is. Who dwells in inapproachable light, whom no eye has seen or can see. However, in Christ, we have been given light. In Christ, we've been given light from the Lord, and we have been made salt, all through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What is the purpose of salt and light? Salt is a savory element, a preservative, something that's spread all over food to make it tasteful and to keep it from putrefying. And if believers are said to be salt, then what are they to spread? They are to spread the savory aroma of the knowledge of Christ in every place, for starters. The gospel is a savory message. It is full of grace. We are to spread the gospel of grace wherever we go. But I believe that the Lord has also in mind our speech. Just our ordinary interactions with others in society should be filled with salt. In what way? Well, Paul says, let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. So gracious speech is salt. Knowing how and when to give an answer to someone is like sprinkling them with salt. Some of us may need to check the level on our salt shakers. If we are a little bit low, then we need to go to the scriptures and uh, get a refill. And after filling... Pray to the Lord to help you spread the salt of his gospel all around. Spread it all around. Spread it everywhere. Do you have problems with your neighbors? Do you have problems at work? Spread some salt on the situation. You are the salt of the earth. You and I are responsible to remedy the situation, at least to do as much as we can. So pour it out. Don't think you are helpless and that there's nothing for you to do. And don't become bitter and complain about the problems. Spread some salt on it. And remember the warning of Christ. If the salt becomes tasteless, it's good for nothing. It's worthless. Good for nothing. That's what happens when the church disengages from the culture and doesn't season it with the salt of the gospel and with the salt of gracious speech. They get walked over. 
they get trampled on, Christ says. What a terrible thing when the church gets trampled on by the world because it refuses to fulfill the purpose for which God made them. What's the purpose of light? Light both dispels darkness and it also helps men to see. Light is meant to be seen. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Impossible. It's in a place high up where everyone can see it. It is open and bare. It is visible. This is so far from the idea of those wish, who wish to privatize their religion. Christ says, it cannot be hidden. That means it is open for all the public to see. The practice of godliness is a public matter. Matthew Henry commented about this, quote, this is what he said, the disciples of Christ must not muffle themselves up in privacy and obscurity under pretense of contemplation, modesty, or self-preservation, but as they have received the gift, must minister the same. They must be burning and shining lights, must evidence in their whole conversation that they are indeed followers of Christ. Or take a lamp. It is absurd to think that someone would light a lamp and then hide it. We are made light in the Lord, by the Lord, for the world to see. God lights us up so that we may shine forth to the world, so that they may see and be drawn to the light. Christ commands us to go into the world, into the public square, and be a light. But if, <clears throat> if we keep ourselves hidden, if we privatize our faith and never interact with the world, then we're being disobedient. Now, there are some here who may object and say, yes, but wouldn't that be proud? Wouldn't that be bragging for us to shine our light for other men to see? Well, it might be, and I'm sure it is for some people. Paul talked about those who preach the gospel um, in, in Philippians. I think it's Philippians, yeah, um, out of selfish ambition. He's, but even there, Paul says, but they're still preaching the gospel. And it may be... Uh, um, but, but the thing is, Christ tells us to shine your light before men. Let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works. Are people seeing our good works? Okay? Christ commands that. We need to work through that and do it in such a way that they may glorify God and not um, us. We must learn how to shine, how to do good works before men, and to give glory to God. Christ commands us to do this. We must be obedient to his command. In conclusion, <clears throat> theology matters in the public square. And it makes a difference. It works. Any honest student of history cannot ignore this fact. David Chilton points out this wonderful truth in his book, Paradise Restored. Quote, listen to this quote. The whole rise of Western civilization, <clears throat> science and technology, medicine, the arts, constitutionalism, the jury system, free enterprise, literacy, increasing productivity, a rising standard of living, the high status of women, is attributable to one major fact. The West has been transformed by Christianity. True, the transformation is not yet complete. There are many battles ahead. But the point is that even in what is still largely an early Christian civilization, God has showered us with many blessings. End quote. I believe what Chilton just said. Christianity has no doubt, no doubt about it, it changed Western society. God has blessed the world through the preaching of the gospel. And the fruits of the gospel, which are obedience to Christ's commands, commands which encompass all of life, this had an incredible effect on Western societies. Not perfectly, but change for the better nonetheless. And I believe that the decay that we're seeing in our culture today is a direct result of the church withdrawing from the public square. 
We have not influenced, not persuaded the world for Christ. Just the gospel, and barely that. The church has embraced a false view of the kingdom, a false view of the world, and a false view of the gospel. This is a tragedy for the church, and it's a tragedy for the world. All hope is not lost, but we need to realize that we are responsible for this mess because we have the remedy for the society's, for society's problems, which is the gospel. But the church has by and large been unfaithful to be a city on a hill for Christ. But Christ will reign victorious. He will subdue his enemies under his feet. He must reign until he makes his enemies his footstool. He rules in the midst of his enemies. Are we with him? Then let's get to work. Let's get to work. We need to stand in the gap. We need to rebuild what has been destroyed. Whether it's abortion, gay mirage, transgenderism, homeschooling, private schooling, government tyranny, or you name it. We, we must take a stand in the public square. Wherever that is, and be the salt, and be the light that God has called us to be. Because we are on the victory side. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony, not loving our lives, not loving our lives unto death. Amen.